I think it's about time to get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Sample. I'm professor of responsible research and innovation at Leibniz University Hanover and the Center for Ethics and Law and the Life Sciences. I'd also like to introduce my co-organizer, Anna Wynn at the Faculty of Humanities, who provided the theme for the series. And she's also the moderator for today's Q&A. So during the talk, if there are any questions you'd like to ask, you can send them to her via the chat function. It should default. I think the, the first chat message that you could send should go to her, but double check before you send it. Um, just a few words, conceptual stuff. I'm sorry if you've heard it before about the motivation for this series. And why do we think uh, literary imagination was an important topic related to science and technology? So the first thing to note is imagination and storytelling are just a core part of what allow science and technology to exist. They allow science and technology, uh, especially the people within them, to have a cognitive schema, a way of understanding the world that un underpins their actions, their coordination, the distribution of resources. And so in, that's sort of the fundamental sociological function of it. But imagination and narrative also have um, a larger ethical political purpose in that they're the ways in which science comes to have meaning, social meaning outside of the lab. And that's where we start to think about science technology as emancipatory, as miraculous, or as violent or oppressive. So um, many people have started to notice this. Uh, I often say that literary is trendy now, but I think there are also scholars who discovered this uh, dynamic, the importance of imagination, long ago and have made it their career to document stories, imagined worlds, and, and related dynamics within technoscience. Um, this includes novelists, authors, and poets from many backgrounds, not only in academia, who have been weaving narratives about science and technology in the world. So I think it's really important that we pay attention to these as well. So in this series, um, we have and continue to bring together thinkers and writers in academia and outside of academia to help us answer some pressing questions like, how do collective narratives shape the impact of science and technology on our daily lives? How can narrative be used to reimagine and reform institutional and cultural forms of science, especially despite their ongoing connections to power and oppression? So thank you for joining us today for um, this part of the series. If you'd like to read along with the talk, you can enable live captions. I can also um, place the link to the script here in the chat. You can read along like that. So today we're so lucky to be joined uh, by Dr. Travis Chi Wing Lao. He's assistant professor at, of English at Kenyon College. His research and teaching focus on 18th and 19th century British literature and culture, health and humanities, and disability studies. Alongside his scholarship, Lao frequently writes for venues of public scholarship like Synapsis, a journal for health humanities, public books, Lapham's Quarterly, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and his poetry has appeared in Word Gathering, Glass, South Carolina Review, Foglifter, and Hypertext, as well as in two chapbooks titled The Bone Setter with Damaged Goods Press and Pairing with Finishing Line Press. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and Travis, over to you. Hi everyone, thanks so much for finding some time today to sit with me and to think with me. Um, I, I'm glad that the uh, script to this entire talk is in the chat, uh, so feel free to read along. Um, but I want to begin with my thanks to Anna and Matthew for this generous invitation to be part of the CELS lecture series and its focus on the literary imagination and its relationship to science, technology, and as a hopefully address today, medicine. This also happens to be my first event outside of the US and the UK, so I'm grateful for your presence during this hectic conclusion of the year. As I have acknowledged at all of my talks this year, I am intensely aware that we are all overextended, overworked, and overwhelmed by the responsibilities and necessities of trying to survive an ongoing pandemic, often without sufficient resources and support, and often not just for ourselves, but for our vulnerable loved ones and for our students and colleagues. Thank you for holding space and energy for me. In the spirit of access, I would like to start with my usual accessibility check-in, a practice that I borrow from my disability studies colleague, Allison Kafer. During this talk, please feel free to inhabit your body mind as fully as possible. Sit, stand, stretch, stim, step away, switch off your camera as you need. I acknowledge that we arrive in this space with different needs. So if I can make this talk accessible to you in any way, please don't hesitate to let me know. 
While I'm immensely grateful to our live captioner, um, I have dropped the link to a full accessibility copy of the script of this talk in the chat. And I welcome your engagement during the Q&A in the Zoom chat, or even by email later on, if that's more accessible to you. I've long resonated with Tanya Tichkowski's definition of access as the quote, interpretive relationship between bodies. And the goal in my scholarship, in my classroom, in this very lecture, is to enable that interpretive relationship as much as possible for the body minds that share space. The translation to the virtual has made access simultaneously more at the center of event programming and pedagogy, but also the first to be neglected in our, in our rush to return to normal, quote unquote, access measures that were introduced during the pandemic are already being dismissed and forgotten. I wanna stress that access is never optional. It is not a series of criteria we check off to claim some kind of mythical form of diversity. It is also not a thing that disabled people should have to beg or fight for when a truly accessible space benefits everyone in the room. This is a collective ongoing effort in which everyone benefits, even as there is no perfectly accessible space, but one that we aspire to as a horizon of possibility. In thinking through what I wanted to do for this talk, I realized that this series presented an opportunity for reflection about my own intellectual formation and how I arrived at the intersections of my interdisciplinary work. Rather than focusing so much on the next steps of my research and its possible futures, I wanted to look backward at the research questions that helped me arrive at my fields of study and which thinkers shaped my understanding of these fields and what my potential interventions are within them. Perhaps this is my sentimentality speaking or my own deep sense of dislocation having begun my first two tenure track years at Kenyon College in the very thick of the pandemic. I have been thinking a lot about Sarah Ahmed's articulation of citational ethics. Quote, citation is feminist memory. Citation is how we acknowledge our debt to those who came before, those who helped us find our way when the way was obscured because we deviated from the paths we were told to follow, end quote. This indebtedness is how I tend to understand myself in relation to my interlocutors less of an antagonistic undermining or taking down, but more an acknowledgement of influence and how others thinking makes mine possible. I also feel a great responsibility for recognizing those who have made possible the conversations I believe are worth having, especially when I myself do not have faith in my place in those conversations. I say all of this as an early career disabled queer scholar of color who has been told directly that I do not belong that I should not belong, that my work is not worth pursuing, and that in the words of a senior scholar should quote, reconsider whether or not I'm really fit for this line of work. I still, I still feel haunted by this language of fitness, a term bound up with the long history of eugenic thinking incubated in American universities, and one often used to gatekeep who gets to participate in knowledge making. If ableism had its way, I simply would not be here, but I digress. As a way of framing my reflections today, I want to return to a lecture that had a profound impact on me during graduate school at a moment when I almost left the profession because I was feeling less and less sure why I was training to be a scholar. In 1959, before an audience in Cambridge's Senate House, C.P. Snow delivered his Reed Lecture which would later be published as The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution in 1961. Snow's key claim was that, quote, the intellectual life of the whole of Western society is increasingly being split into two polar groups with literary intellectuals at one pole and scientists at the other, each with their own distinct cultures of argumentation and scholarly engagement. The consequence was an irreconcilable divide between literature and science, and to use Snow, Snow's words, between the two, a gulf of mutual incomprehension. Sometimes, particularly among the young, hostility and dislike, but most of all, lack of understanding, end quote. For Snow, such division marked a tragic set of missed opportunities for more robust, innovative inquiry. 
quote, this polarization is sheer loss to us all, he laments, to us as people and to our society. It is at the same time practical and intellectual and creative loss, end quote. This account should sound all too familiar, especially for us in the room now, because in many ways we have only intensified the dynamics that Snow describes. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic repeatedly demanding epidemiologists, public health officials, and healthcare professionals to take seriously the ethical, philosophical, and narrative perspectives from the humanities, I continue to hear them insist uh, on it as a problem of science, as if anti-science movements like vaccine hesitancy and refusal were not themselves problems of culture that could be explained away purely by rationality and positivism. As a scholar currently writing a monograph on the cultural and literary history of vaccination, I cannot unwitness the ways that vaccination was always, from its inception, a narrative problem that even Edward Jenner, the originator of vaccination, had to contend with as part of his campaigns for nationwide vaccination in Britain. While I don't want to be too reductive about this, this scientism, or my favorite version of the term I've, I've heard used, scientolatry, the worldview that only science has access to truth about the natural world and can produce authoritative knowledge about its realities has increasingly come to stand in for science itself. I realized quickly during graduate school that this is what vexed me most about the kinds of interdisciplinary conversations in which I kept finding myself. Interdisciplinarity was reduced to people of different disciplines in the room, and the fact was that STEM folks did not take seriously the humanists in the room and what they had to offer. And the humanists had similarly little investment in understanding the sciences with which they believed to be in dialogue and critiquing. Out of frustration at the impasses that seemed to confirm Snow's point again and again, I began to think about what it would mean to take up Christina Sharp's invitation that, quote, we must become undisciplined or to begin the uncertain process Susan Squire describes as, quote, wandering across disciplines, looking for that undisciplined third space where one can think strange thoughts and even make mistakes. What I desired were true entanglements that embodied the truly co-constitutive relationship between literature and science. I didn't want to untie the Gordian knot so much as find myself that much more entangled in it. In many ways, this entanglement became clearest to me in history. Trained primarily as an 18th centuryist, I found myself working in a period well before the irreconcilable differences between literature and science that Snow wrung his hands over. In fact, it is the great permeability between these domains during this period that most excites me and which allowed me to understand literature and science as, quote, dynamic partners rather than unwelcome guests or hereditary enemies, not always, congen not always congenial, but necessarily in dialogue. Uh, and that is taken from Waichi Demock and Priscilla Wald's uh, brilliant preface to their uh, special issue, Literature and Science, Cultural Forms and Conceptual Exchanges. Um, I was just really struck by what that um, special issue was trying to do, and I felt like it was really in line with what um, I think good interdisciplinary work does. So as scholars like Tita Chico, who I know is here, uh, Devin Griffiths, Noel Gallagher, Laura Miller, Joseph Drury, Heather Meek, Clark Lawler, Al Coppola, and Danielle Spratt, to name just a few, have argued 18th century science was literature just as much as 18th century literature was science. Rather than the longstanding unidirectional models of influence, the interdisciplinary scholarship I found and continue to find most invigorating attends to the shared rhetorics, networks, practices, and epistemological and ontological structures that transit between literature and science that we have long neglected precisely because of our disciplinary divides and unstrategic presentism. At its best, the, this work defamiliarizes the very terms of science and literature we think we know and have inherited by recasting them into what Marie Mulvey Roberts and Roy Porter have once described as the one culture of enlightenment society. As you can imagine, it saddened me greatly to hear some scholars dismiss this work 
because they had internalized so intensely Snow's damning conclusion that literature and science have always already been and forever will be separated into the two cultures. But this is also a reminder of what disciplines do. They discipline by shaping the questions we can ask, how we ask them, as well as determining what objects are worthy of answering those questions. As I learned to attend to and later teach the use of metaphor by Thomas Sydenham, George Cheney, Bernard Mandeville, and, George, and John Buchan, as much as I did to those by Alexander Pope, Anne Finch, Mary Wollstonecraft, and Eliza Haywood, I realized the great extent to which 18th century medical and scientific writers organized and shaped their materials literarily which begged close reading of not just their claims, but how and why they made their claims and to which audiences. To put this in Tita Chico's words, this demands that we attend to quote, science as a form of figuration, a kind of literary act. In my classroom, English majors and STEM majors find themselves in semester long processes of what Heather Meek has so brilliant described as unlearning where pre-meds come to recognize, quote, that the physician should not play God and that patient voices should be heeded, just as much as English majors come to realize that, quote, the supposedly authoritative scientific physician cannot be rightfully dismissed as merely domineering and oppressive. Again, the messiness of the entanglement is what I try to reproduce in the classroom if only to have my students deliberately disoriented by the shift in historical context that precedes the trappings of the two cultures model, which so often precludes much more difficult but generative conversations about, for example, 18th century fiction's co-optation of scientific language in its representation of character, or 18th century medicine's deployment of novelistic techniques in the production of the case study, itself a narrative genre. To address a key question of this series, how has narrative been used to reimagine and reform institutional and cultural forms of science despite their ongoing connections to power and oppression? I think this is about mutual implication in politics, in culture, in the social. I'm reminded of Dr. Anthony Fauci's own claims that you cannot be ideological about science and that public health is apolitical. Looking at this longer history of medicine and science reveals just how impossible that position actually is and how dangerous its reinforcement of the two cultures can be. After all, we are living in a present in which medicine and science refuses to take seriously the public in public health and all of its baggage. So what about pain? I've lived nearly two decades with chronic pain, one of many manifestations of my scoliosis-related disabilities, which has shaped every facet of my capacity to think, write, and participate in spaces like these. To be honest, for years, I pursued the question of origins. Does pain's nature change just because I can now name it? Despite having shared most of my life with pain, I only recently learned the formal name of my disability, kyphoscoliosis, a combination of two spinal deformities, kyphosis from the Greek kyphos meaning bent, referring to the rounding of the upper back that can create a severe curve colloquially referred to as a hunchback, and scoliosis, the curvature of the spine left or right into a S or C shape. Kyphoscoliosis often manifests in childhood and usually gets identified through routine screenings done in grade school. If diagnosed early enough, physical therapy or bracing can prevent further curvature or even correct it. Yet for many, including myself, the curvature can develop late and without cause, what medical professionals describe as idiopathic. While kyphoscoliosis is referred to as a singular diagnostic entity, it is also a conflation of two separate spinal deformities. Accompanying this complex condition is the host of other conditions related to its effects on my musculoskeletal system, from shortness of breath due to the contortion of my rib cage, as well as brain fog, anxiety, and irritable bowel syndrome closely linked with my chronic pain. Without the certainty of origins, a younger me found it easy to speculate wildly, 
to blame genes and the follies of nurture, to blame my own ignorant self. Why this set of conditions? Why this pain? And if I found out why, what then? I spent years writing toward these origins that I slowly sensed were illusory, if not ultimately irrelevant. I have been, for better or for worse, doing what Heather Love has called feeling backwards, feeling back toward histories that I am only just now realizing are part of my own, histories that I did not know I could claim, histories that have always exceeded the boundaries between the two cultures because body minds like my own were always the objects of medicine as much as we exceeded them. It goes without saying that this is all painful work to have written this talk, to be delivering it to you now as my spine continues to curve and the surrounding muscle and tissue tighten. And I struggle a little more to take deeper breaths as the positioning of my rib cage inhibits the fuller expansion of my lungs. Alongside my investigations into the shifting cultural significations of pain before and after the development of surgical anesthesia, where pain moved from spiritual trial to eradicable condition, poetry became a way for me to pay better attention to the chronicities of my own body and to acknowledge what it actually takes for me to write, to acknowledge it as labor. The very first of my crip experiments with poetry was to mark the moments when pain arrived at the scene of my writing. Slashes punctuating the lines, line breaks whenever I would lose a train of thought or feel too much pain to continue. I wanted to concretize what attends me at my desk, what we in this profession and in publishing are asked to disavow because it does not rehearse trauma in ways that are marketable and palatable. What might it mean to write about pain that does not conform to the templates we are given about how to write about immigrant pain, queer pain, and disabled pain? That reductive pain scale that reduces us to numbers, for instance. Pain that is not simply trauma porn, or worse yet, reducible to narratives of overcoming that reinscribe me as the model minority, as the good crip that is not limited by his disabilities and able to overcompensate or the good queer who proves it really does get better. I wanted to write to expand what was being written about pain that perversely reinscribed certain forms of pain as the pain we're supposed to feel and also talk about in prescribed over-determined ways. I came to resent writing about pain that really was not about pain at all, but about its necessary transformation or its beautification so it isn't just all ugly. To write and publish poems formed in pain, suffused by pain, also meant being in pain in public. Readers invited to interpret my body and make, in, in many cases, make diagnostic assumptions about my body, my mismanagement of it, and to lament its tragic deformity. I've been thinking a lot about the work of ethical witnessing, especially with pain. How do I witness my own pain ethically and relinquish any sense of defensive ownership of my pain once I've released it into the world? Is my pain my own anymore? Or is that precisely the point, to have done what Elaine Scarry believes is impossible? For those of you who have some familiar, familiarity with my work over these recent years, you know that I've spent much of my career responding to Elaine Scarry's 1985, The Body in Pain, which articulated the argument that pain is antithetical to language to the extent that it destroys it. This troubled me for many reasons. Scary's model precludes the possibility for solidarity and relationality between those in pain and their witnesses, not to mention she seems to bypass the possibility of relation between those in pain themselves. To insist on an unbridgeable chasm of meaning between them feels like a lazy acceptance of futility without the difficult, painful work of attending to embody-minded difference. For me and for many other folks in the disability community, pain has been nothing but effusive proliferations of language, not reducible to prelingual cries and shouts or just violent metaphors of stabbing or burning. Is it really that pain destroys language or have we just been really bad? at attending to lived experiences of pain because we can only see it as purely undesirable 
or that stubborn reminder of our tender organs, to use the late Tobin Sieber's words? Have we created the conditions, spaces, and contexts where those in pain are invited to contribute to the development of their own language of pain experience and respected for those metaphorical and figurative choices that aren't merely diversions on a linear path to curative reparation. This is where I see poetry as crepistemology or the meaningful recognition of disabled experience as knowledge making, as worthy of learning from. I want to participate in the project of proliferation of language and knowing and being that as Alison Pat Savis puts it with such clarity, those that permit us to think pain otherwise, to produce painful new knowledge, but also to construct analyses about pain that are less painful and less dangerous to those of us in pain. And in doing so to reimagine our shared pained futures. It is never about painful singularities, but about painful encounters and kinship forged from those encounters. Thanks everyone.